Hi everybody, and welcome to the experiment on the synthesis of calcium chloride, in which you're going to study the reaction of this compound you make with sodium alginate. I hope this lab is interesting. Uh, I think you're going to see things you've never seen before, and uh, make some observations that are really unique, and also learn about the way in which chemistry and food interact. So let's get right to the lecture. The area of molecular gastronomy allows chemists and cooks to interact and change the physical properties of food. Molecular mojitos, not served in a glass, but rather served in bubbles. Similar to these bubbles, or it would be a vegan caviar. These are not actually fish eggs. They're produced in much the same way that you're going to see in lab today. Also using the material in lab today, you can make transparent tagliatelle. This is molecular gastronomy. Today's lab is going to start with the reaction of calcium. So this is calcium metal. The photograph I picked of it is untarnished calcium. It's been recently sliced with a knife, so it's shiny. The calcium you see is going to be dull because it's got an oxide coating, uh, just like when silver tarnishes. Calcium reacts with water to give you calcium hydroxide. And I'm pointing out that calcium hydroxide is not a new compound. It has been used for a long time in the preparation of foods. The process of nixtilization, in which corn is reacted with calcium hydroxide and water, does three things for corn. It softens the outer husk, making it more digestible. This also makes the niacin in the corn more available to the human body. Also, corn and grains that are stored tend to grow mold that produces aflatoxin, which is a dangerous poison to humans. Cooking the corn in the calcium hydroxide removes those toxins, destroys those toxins. This is an ancient process of the native peoples of the America. You're going to make calcium hydroxide today and then react it with hydrochloric acid. This is going to give you calcium chloride. Calcium chloride has food uses currently. Look on a can of tomatoes and you'll find out that it includes calcium chloride. This keeps the tomatoes firm. Most of the calcium chloride in the world that is produced, however, goes into anti-icing applications. Whenever you encounter a reaction, you should write the balanced reaction in your notebook and also make a table of reagents. So I want to give you an example of how that is done. Uh, looking at the procedure, you'll find that the procedure actually gives you amounts in moles. The procedure says to add 0.05 moles of calcium. Well, it has a molecular weight of 40, which means that the amount you really add would be 2 grams. The water is added in excess. The molecular weight is 18, and that's not really even important. I mention that because not every box in the table has to be filled out. Use your judgment about what is important. So you would put the actual amount of, of mils the procedure calls for here. This will give you 0 0.05 moles of calcium hydroxide. You can look up that molecular weight and use it to calculate the theoretical yield of calcium hydroxide. You could argue that this isn't really important, however, because we're not isolating the calcium, hydro calcium hydroxide. We're never going to measure our yield in lab. This would be just the theoretical yield. Now, you need the balanced equation, which requires two moles of HCl. That is why the procedure calls for adding moles, uh, 0.1 mole of HCl. Now this is provided as a three molar solution, which means that, let's see, 0.1 over three is 33.3 mils. That's the amount of HCl that you would use. The amount of calcium chloride that you could potentially make 
according to the balanced reaction, is 0.05 moles. And again, you could add a molecular weight and calculate this theoretical yield. We're not isolating the calcium chloride, so we'll never actually know the real yield of the reaction. So it is very important to have this table of reaction because it allows us to think about the synthesis as a method. This is how we're making calcium chloride, 100 mils of a 0.5 molar solution. Can we add, uh, sorry, can we make one liter of that? Well, yes, it seems like adjusting all of these quantity amounts by a factor of 10 and you would be successful. This just gives you a place to start. You would also need to think about what equipment you would use and what safety issues are a reality. Can you make 100 mils, our original amount of four molar calcium chloride? Well, you would need to modify the procedure because the original procedure used three molar HCl. So anything you make with that is going to be three molar or less concentrated. So you've got two choices. Choice number one is perform the synth synthesis and then concentrate the product. In other words, just boil off some of the water. Option number two is to start with stronger, say maybe 5 molar HCl. Now you would use less, you would have to keep the moles the same. You would need, you would need to adjust the moles according to the new concentration of the hydrochloric acid. Can we use this method to make something completely different? Can I make calcium sulfate? Well, that would involve changing the hydrochloric acid and instead substituting in sulfuric acid. You would also need to use a new balanced equation. It's no longer 1 is to 2 calcium to chloride, it is 1 is to 1 calcium to sulfate. So we could go on with more examples. For example, can we make sodium sulfate? This would require, instead of using calcium, to use sodium. You would have to adjust the amount you used, the number of grams, and also the moles because the equation balances differently. That is why in the introduction in the, uh, this lab, you're going to see when you read it, when you write a synthesis in your pre-lab, make a table of reagents and include a balanced reaction. These things aren't busy work. They explain the actual experiment that you're doing. The other stuff you're using in this is called sodium alginate. This comes from a natural product that's found in seaweed, particularly uh, prevalent in kelps. This is where we get this material, and it is a polymer. Now, this may be a bit of a review of your high school chemistry, but a polymer is a chain of repeating subunits. My analogy here is a paperclip chain. Now, polymer structures are very hard to write, so when we go to talk about structures, we use a shorthand notation that's indicated here with the brackets. The brackets simply show the simplest sub repeating subunit. Then N is an average either number of subunits or, more commonly, the average molecular weight of the polymer. To show you real molecules with this, I want to use something that you're talking a lot about in class right now, and that would be ethylene. Or more systematically called ethene.
ethene polymerizes and this goes on and on many times. That's why we need shorthand structure and that would be CH2, CH2, one repeating subunit. So N ethenes give N repeating subunits of the polymer. This polymer is polyethylene. It's the plastic used to make milk jugs and um, single-use disposable plastic bags like in, you find in the grocery store. Uh, it also can be manufactured in a much more high-quality way to make durable goods. PE or polyethylene. I also want to point out that this is a perfectly valid time to talk about line structures. This would also be the structure of polyethylene. The polymer, the alginic acid that is in kelp, has a structure that looks like this. It has two different repeating subunits. One if we can sort of highlight in red, and the other one can simply be purple. Now you don't need to write the structure for alginic acid. You can Google it just like I did. But one of these is a manuronic acid, and the other is a guleronic acid. Even these structures are really tough to write. At the core, the backbone of the polymer, you see something that looks a lot like a sugar ring, and it's got functional groups hanging off of it. If you'll notice, the guleronic acid has alcohols and a carboxylic acid back here. The manuronic acid has the same thing, except the stereochemistry of that group the acid group is different. This is down, and that is up. This should dovetail nicely with what you're studying in class right now, line structures uh, and also stereochemistry and functional groups. So I said this is alginic acid, and in lab we're going to be using sodium alginate. So I want to show you how you get from alginic acid to sodium alginate, and in the process, use a different kind of even more simple polymer shorthand. Uh, what we care about in this polymer structure right now is the carboxylic acids. So I'm not even going to draw the backbone of the, of the polymer chain. I'm simply going to think of it like this. This is a cartoon structure of a polymer. You're probably familiar with cartoon structures of proteins and cartoon structures of DNA. Again, the structures are just too complicated, so we sometimes we make cartoons of them. Alginic acid makes alginate. You have the IC ending. You end up with ATE. That indicates that you're going to have the anion of the carboxylic acid. So, for example, you re react this with or this is reacted for us, with sodium hydroxide. And the reaction you get is the deprotonation of an acid. Acid-base reaction, we've done in this class, we've covered a lot. COO minus Na plus COO minus Na plus COO minus Na plus. Sodium alginate is a convenient powder. It is very slow dissolving, kind of a property of most polymers that do dissolve. When they do, they do it slowly. So we have actually made this solution in advance for you because it takes overnight to dissolve. So you'll find this in the lab already as a solution. All right, I hope you find today's lab fun and interesting and you get to observe things that you've never seen before. You should have already turned your crystal in and gotten rid of the alum solution and uh, got your bin all clean for next semester. 
at the end of the lab, we want you to get those um, inventory cards out and make sure that the drawers are exactly as they appear on that inventory card. Enjoy the lab today.